type in the uh, username and password, and then basically, if you have Bloomberg Mail, obviously you can read your messages. <coughs> but in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to do a, a quick five forces analysis on a different company. So I thought uh, <coughs> today would be Chipotle Day. So if we wanted to look up Chipotle, because they've been in the news recently, start typing in their name or ticker symbol, and down in the bottom half of the screen, it will start <coughs> uh, filtering out the appropriate companies. In this case, Chipotle, CMG is our ticker symbol. Uh, again, equity is for stock analysis. Corp is for analyzing bonds, debt, or what's called fixed income. In this case, CMG US equity is, so it's the US stock, it's Chipotle, hit enter. It'll bring you to the menu for options to analyze equity. Again, Bloomberg works on short codes, so you can either type in the code or you can click on one of the menu items. Uh, for the EIC, you'd want to do beta. So that's the short code in Bloomberg for beta. Hit enter and it will bring you to the beta screen. And so again, uh, I'm going to recommend that for our purposes for EIC, we're going to want a five-year beta. Bloomberg defaults to two years worth of data on the screen. So if you want to change the date range, just come in the from range, 2010, change that to 2007, hit enter, brings in the new data points, redraws the line, uh, does the analysis on the line. So basically, if we think about EIC for Chipotle, what would we say about them given this data? So think about the E, the economic sensitivity, which is really question one in the homework assignment. Okay. So 0.985 is probably about as sensitive as the average company in the marketplace. And that's really all we're really trying to assess here is that, you know, again, in a couple weeks, we're going to be forecasting out financial statements. And basically, if a company has a beta similar to the market, we probably don't want to forecast straight lines because the company's going to have some level of economic sensitivity, especially if it has a beta close to one, which means there's going to be some cyclicality to the company's financial performance. Right? Whereas if a company had a very low beta stock, maybe we don't have to worry as much about the cyclicality. And if a company had a very high beta, we're probably going to want to forecast much more cyclicality to a company. But ultimately, <coughs> Chipotle is going to be somewhat affected by changes in the economy, but it's going to be about the same as, as any other company. And that's really just what we're trying to get with our E um, type of analysis. Right? So questions about the E for Chipotle. Right? So to get the I industry, we're going to do the five forces analysis. So in this case, <coughs> in Bloomberg, the short code for that is RV, okay? stands for relative value. And under the RV section of Bloomberg, what it will allow you to do is to compare one company against others against a series of financial data. Okay? So again, you can either get to it off the main menu or you can type in RV directly. You'll see the functions are in the top half of the screen, in this case, relative value. Hit enter or go. And this will bring up the company against the peers. Right? Now, again, it's using the general industry classification codes. So you can see it's doing it by industry. Chipotle is put into hotel, restaurants, and leisure. So if you wanted to click sub-industry, you can just click on restaurants. And that would be Chipotle against the restaurant peers based on that standard industry classification. But again, in this class, what I'm going to recommend that we use is up here where it says comp source, instead of using the general industry classification, what you can do is you can click on the uh, drop box and we're going to use what's called the Bloomberg comps. Right? The reason why we're going to use the Bloomberg comps, <coughs> two reasons. One, in the Bloomberg comps, Bloomberg, somebody at Bloomberg has taken the time to select the peers. Okay, so therefore, if they think that there are some peers that may or may not be appropriate in the industry classification, they can either add them or filter them out. But the other reason is that down here at the bottom of this menu 
is the ability to edit the comparables. And that later, if you click on edit the comparables, you can either add peers yourself and or you can eliminate peers. So if you wanted to get rid of Brinker, you could uncheck Brinker, you could save it, and then Brinker would be gone from the list. Okay. So, or if you wanted to add, I don't know, Walmart, then you can add Walmart to the list. Okay. So that is something you cannot do with the industry classification code because it's just whatever's in that industry classification code. But with the Bloomberg peers, they do give you the ability to edit the peer list. So that's one of the advantages of using the Bloomberg peers is that you can filter out any outliers that you deem are outliers and or add any companies that you want to make to your peer list. All right, for now, we're just going to use the, uh, the peers. I'm going to discard my changes. So I'm just using the standard Bloomberg peers. And then the final step is going to be to filter out the data that we want. So again, Bloomberg works by tabs, and that's their metaphor. And in this case, I can get some data based on tabs. So for example, if I click on comp sheets, there's a series of uh, sub tabs. So for example, there's some defaulted profitability numbers, uh, balance sheet numbers, market data. So again, I can look at volatility, performance, etc. But in this case, the other option is to go to custom. And so with custom, <clears throat> we have the ability to choose our own ratios. Okay. Now, I've already saved some custom templates here that I've been using in Bloomberg in my account, saved by your account. But in this case, let's say you want to compare some data. So for add column, <clears throat> let's say I wanted to get the ROIC of a company. So if I start typing in the metric that I want to add, in this case, ROIC shows me return invested capital and some of the other ones. I could click on return and invested capital and I'll say which return invested capital do I want? In this case, I want the one based on the latest year. But I could also do a customized period. So for example, if I wanted previous years, so I can go calendar years ago or fiscal years ago, I could go historical return invested capital if I wanted to as a data point. But for right now, for return invested capital, I want it based on the latest filing, or sorry, latest year. Hit enter, and then it basically adds that data point right, immediately for all the peers. Matter of fact, what I'm going to want to compare that against for the industry spread is the WAC. So I type in WACC, hit enter, and it adds the WAC to my data set. Right. So again, just about any financial ratio is in here. As a matter of fact, you can create your own ratios. So you can build your own formulas if, if you wanted to. So it's a very powerful way, not only for this class, but for any class you're taking, uh, to get data and to basically do some very quick peer analysis. Actually, one of the other nice features of Bloomberg <clears throat> is the output button, which is pretty much in any data screen. If you click output, then one of the options is to dump all this data to Excel. So therefore, you could then do your filters, get all your data, dump it to Excel, and then bring it with you to whatever you need. Okay? So again, that's probably going to be more the useful part of what you're going to have to do as part of your group projects because you're going to basically not probably be using it in the lab here. You're going to probably be dumping the data and then working at it outside of the lab. So you'll probably be outputting it to Excel. Okay? So <clears throat> the other option that you have is if I like the template that I've created, I could click on the Save As button and then save this as a template for reuse. Okay, so I'll just call this my 760 template. And so now, anytime, I did another 761 for my master's class, but <clears throat> anytime I go to a company and I click on this template, then it would bring up these variables for those companies, right? for that company I'm looking at and its peers. So that's just, again, a very useful feature. And then here's the, the final thing, which is we need to do an industry I analysis. We need the industry average. So mm -hmm. down here at the bottom, there's an option to select the stats. And if I click on select stats, it gives me some basic statistics that I can do to the data. And the one that we're going to care about is the market cap weighted average. So instead of doing a straight average, okay, which is simplistic and we could do, 
we do want to weight the bigger firms to be more important than the smaller firms. Right? So that's why we're going to use the market cap weighted average. So again, it'll do the average based on a weighting of the size of the firms based on market value. So again, hit update. And so essentially, the average ROIC based on a weighted average of the industry is 22%. 22.71% and the average WAC 7.65%. Okay. So now what I've just done is I've created my industry spread. Right. Kind of questions about what we just did? Yes? Does it allow you to, I mean, look at some of these companies that have much larger market caps than others. Does it allow you to break it down, filter based off the market caps, and maybe you want to compare, you know, for Chipotle, maybe something under 10 billion? Five and well, like I said, if you click on any of the columns, you notice it's sorting. Okay. So let's say that I wanted to get rid of anybody under five billion, so I made Panera my break off. Then again, I could edit my comparables at this point and then just sort by market cap. Okay. And I can get rid of these small companies just by unchecking them okay. and then saving them without the list. But in this case, as I said, I I think that <clears throat> the small firms are representative of, of pure competitors of Chipotle because they are some of these fast food companies. And number two, because their market cap weighted average, small companies are not going to have a substantial effect on the industry ROIC. So even if they're an outlier and they're doing really well because they're small, you know, if it's one out of 50, one billion out of 50 billion average for the market, it's going to be weighted way down. Okay. So again, that's the advantage. If you were doing straight average, I'd absolutely agree. That some of the small firms, if you're doing an average, could definitely skew your analysis. But by using the feature within Bloomberg for the market cap weighted average, then leaving the small firms in is probably easier to do and more representative, especially if they're peers. Right? Because I believe that people do make choices between Chipotle's and Wendy's, for example. So even though Wendy's doesn't have a... Um, <coughs> some people are looking at me like, what? You go to Wendy's, but I think people do. <clears throat> All right, so let's go back to this. We got our industry spread. So let's talk through our five forces analysis. And since the people watching the video won't be able to see the whiteboard, I'm going to use Excel as our virtual whiteboard here. So I'm going to open up Excel. And so in this case, <clears throat> As you think through the five forces analysis, we have buyer power, we have supplier power, we have substitutes, we have entry and exit barriers, we have rivalry, and then we have the overall. And then we also have the current and the five year in the future. So. <clears throat> The one number that if we follow the process that we talked about briefly at the end of last class where we're using a five-point scale to represent the uh, numerical scores for the current and the five-year forces, the one number that is most quantifiable here is the overall. Right, because that is based on an observation of the current industry spread. And so again, in the scale that we're using, a, on an arbitrary 1 to 5 scale, a 3 means 0 spread. A number above a 3 is a positive spread. A number below a 3 is a negative spread. So then the question is for Chipotle, how would we rank the overall? And again, I'll go back to the Bloomberg data. So... What is this spread? It's about almost 14, 15 points. Yeah. So does this look like an attractive industry? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So right now, and, and that's what I said, we can go back to <clears throat> the book data where they showed us industry data over the last 40 years, approximately. <clears throat> and if you look at pharma, the average industry was about 9, and pharma was in the low 20s. That's about 13, 14% spread over the average. So if you think about historical context right now, fast food is a phenomenally attractive industry. So I might even score that a five. Right? Just If I'm looking at the current industry ROIC against the WAC, right now I'm going to score that a five. 
or at least a four and a half. So it's a very, very attractive industry. So as part of my analysis, now what I want to start to understand is why is this industry so attractive given these forces? So if I think about buyer power, supplier power, substitutes, entry and exit barriers, rivalry, what makes this industry attractive? So if that force is part of why the industry is so attractive, then you should score that force very high. If that force is not allowing the industry to be attractive financially, then you should score the force lower. Right? So again, the way to think of this is if buyer power allowed this industry and it was the only force to earn its cost of capital, then buyer power would be a three. Right? If buyer power allowed this industry to earn a phenomenal rate of return because the buyers don't have any power, then you should score buyer power a five. Because right? you're basically saying the buyers are what are explaining this industry making money. So the way we're, we're using the scale is not is buyer power strong, we're trying to say, is buyer power allowing this industry to make a lot of return or not? Okay. So let's go back to Chipotle and fast food. So again, we're not really talking about just Chipotle. We're now talking about fast food type of, of restaurants. Right. So why is this industry so attractive? Mm -hmm. what, which of these forces do you think are really helping this industry right now? Looking for opinions. I'm sure many of you have at least some experience with these companies. Yes? Low supplier power? All right, so why do you think the supplier powers are low? Because they can get the basic ingredients from anywhere they want. Okay, so a lot of the suppliers are commodities. Okay, so give me a number. So when you say low supplier power, how much does that help this industry's profitability on that five-point scale? Maybe four. Okay. Why didn't you say five? Um, depends. So if, it's, if a restaurant says it's organic, then they have only a limited number of uh, suppliers that they have to do. Okay. So in some cases, it's not purely that there's just a commodity suppliers, there's no power. Sometimes because of their choices, there might be some power because of the choices they have to make. Okay, just, just trying to get a, an assessment because that's part of what you have to do. When you give me a number on your homework assignment and eventually on your group project, because this is actually one of the things you're going to have to do for your group projects, this is one-fourth of your group project right here, is that you also have to give me your point of view for why this number is the case. Now, now by the way, <clears throat> this is also where IBIS reports come in because you could have downloaded the IBIS report off the portal, gotten the industry analysis for Chipotle, and then essentially use that to help you with this. So again, we, we don't have to do this organically ourselves. Since we're using real data and real companies, we're also welcome to use real industry reports on what the, they say about this industry. Right? But for purposes of process, we're just practicing here in class, <clears throat> we'll call it a four. Right? What else is allowing this industry to make money? Yeah. So you're saying that because there's a lot of customers, the buyers don't have power? Simply they do. They do. So that should be hurting the industry, profitability. Oh, I think you were asking. Okay. And I'm just saying, so for the buyer force, we're, again, if you think the buyers have a lot of power, then the industry shouldn't be making 20-something percent ROIC. <clears throat> Right. So translate that into a number here on a five-point scale. How much power do you think the buyer? Where's the where's that scale of relationship? So if, if you said three, let's put the three in here. What you're saying is this industry, because the buyers have some choice, should only be making its cost of capital. No, but it's specialized. They have an industry in regards to that their own differentiator. Why? Well, remember that when we say differentiated industry, right now we're defining the industry to include all these other companies, like Jack in the Box, Cheesecake Factory, Fast Food, you got Papa John's, Domino's are in here, Panera, Burger King, you know, the high end of the scale, McDonald's is in here, Starbucks, Yum, which is uh, Taco Bell and uh, KFC, you know, Darden Restaurants, which I think includes, uh, is that one Hardee's? 
or Olive Garden, Olive Garden. So I don't even know who Brinker is. Is it Chili's? Okay, thank you. All right. So again, back to the force. Are buyers exhibiting a lot of power against this industry? If you believe they are, then I guess let's go back to this. What's causing this industry to make so much profit? What's allowing this industry to be so attractive? Which of these other three forces? Are there not a lot of substitutes for fast food? There are. Are they viable? Yes. And, and again, it's it's we're, we have a, a definite observation point about what this industry is doing. So I know that there are substitutes, but the real question is, are people exercising their choice to go to the substitutes? Is, you know, so for example, eating at a uh, grocery store, you can get, you know, takeout kind of ready-made meals. I assume that's a, that's a viable substitute for fast food industry. You know, is that really hurting them? You know, you got the more sit-down restaurants. Is that the formalized sit-down restaurants? Does that appear to hurting fast food? You're going to make a comment? Oh, yeah. In terms of which force, I, I think yep. the one that's driving it is entry and exit. Specifically, the barriers to entry, I would say, are very high because all of the, um, yeah, so five. Nine, okay. Because all of the companies that you listed have extensive networks that are nationwide, leasing agreements in place, distribution, distribution channels. So, so building out a national network of fast food type chains is very prohibitively expensive. And that's allowing these firms to really profit right now. Yes, yes. Okay. So obviously there's an advantage to a brand, there's an advantage to a national brand, and it's hard for somebody else to create a national brand. Right. Okay. So that's helping the industry profit. Yes. Okay. I buy that. Yes. So does rivalry be considered rivalry among firms within that industry? That's right. Substitutes are. So yes. I would, I would argue that's probably pretty low. Well, so so you think that there's just cutthroat rivalry? Um, I mean, in terms of pricing and location and, I guess, generalized the type of food that they offer, yeah, it's pretty high rivalry among the, among the firms. Okay. Does everybody agree with that? Isn't, isn't rivalry also based on, like, driving prices down? Like, I don't know if they're... Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, I was just going to say, have, have you been to Chipotle? I mean, a, you know, a burrito, burrito bowl, those, those things are actually pretty expensive. And even the quote-unquote value meal at McDonald's, it's $6 now. It used to be $3. I mean, I think these firms are, have generally been raising prices almost, I don't use the word collusively, but they've been kind of raising prices, and it doesn't seem to be deterring their sales. Now, I say that, and McDonald's the last two days just reported same-store sales that plummeted for like the first time in a decade. So maybe their prices went up too high too fast. But in terms of the rivalry, like I said, let's go back to this industry. If you look at the observable returns, they don't seem to be appearing to do cutthroat price competition like you might see in an airline industry or other industries where it's, it's much more commodity-based and people are switching. So, uh, how again... That, how much of that is driven by suppliers and just the overall commodity prices going up versus the rivalry of among firms. I mean, like, if they're collectively all raising their prices... Which we have to determine. Right. I mean, that that's subjective. So, so again, you could say rivalry is hurting. You know, we, we could, to some degree, as we said, there's no real answer on this one. There could be some difference of opinion. We're kind of going through a process here. But let's just say that we go with your rivalry hurting the industry. Then let's go back to substitutes. Yeah. Can I go back to buyer power for a second? Sure. I guess what I'm trying to explain is that Chipotle has that power because the customers are wanting to go to Chipotle. So what does that mean? That's that competitive power? advantage. So okay. so basically the way we're structuring our analysis, the E, the I, and the C, mm -hmm. is the I, we're talking about Chipotle and its peers. Right. And then we get to the C, the competitive advantage, then we're going to talk about Chipotle's ability against the peers to make more or less money. So you, wouldn't you still say it's higher though? Like wouldn't it be four or five because... Well, as I said, let's go back to what we're defining as the industry. These are the companies that we're defining as the industry. It's these 15 companies. Right. All right. So I'm not saying that the buyers 
you know, maybe the buyers for these companies are not that that strong. They're not making as many choices as they should. So again, it's not that they don't have power. If they're choosing not to exercise the power, it's the same thing. So we have choices, but if we keep going back to the same places, then we're not really exercising our choices, whether it's through loyalty or laziness. Yes? I was going to say buyers and substitutes replace really them one another. Like, yes. There are plenty of substitutes, but they don't really, I mean, Morton isn't exactly a substitute for Burger King or Chipotle or something like that. It's just like going to Harris Teeter and getting a takeout at the meal. It, it, you're getting fed, but it's not exactly the same experience. People aren't going to the same much. So. so maybe we'll start including half points in here. Call that a four and a half. And I'd, I'd reduce buyer. Maybe if reduce as in? As take, make it to, um, reduce as in it's hurting the profit or reduce as in it's helping the profit? I guess reduce as in buyers have less power, so it's helping the profit. Buyers having less power is a higher number. Yeah, so uh, increase it before we or three. So. Okay. And, and so, as I said, as you're doing this for Best Buy, ideally you've kind of read through the industry report to give you some additional information if you're not that familiar with the industry by people who are doing this for a living. But at the same time, here's process-wise. Notice <clears throat> that... These numbers don't average out to a five, and that's okay because for five forces, some forces could be more important than others, right? So you might say, you know what? The um, suppliers don't have a lot of power, but they're not that important, right? But what really matters is the entry and exit, which are keeping other people out. So if there were more fast food national chains, obviously it would be much more competitive and it would be much more rivalry. But because the, the barriers are so high and we're not talking about that many chains, the big chains are actually prospering because they're a big brand of chains. There's not that many of them. Yes? I'm struggling to figure out how to think about these categories here because it seems like we're going with the entry and exit being a five because that almost fits in line with the overall score that we've already found. You have to fit, you have to fit this to the overall scores. So I'm telling you, if you tell me that this is an attractive industry, and I'm saying you're defining an attractive industry by absolute observation of the industry ROIC, and you give every other score a three, then that doesn't make any sense. Sure. So you can't tell me that the industry is attractive and that none of the factors for the industry are allowing it to be attractive. That, that is just not logical. So, yes. so that's what I'm saying. We have to figure out which of those forces are cause, or combination of forces are causing this industry to make 22%. It's tough, though, because I'm looking at the IBIS report, and Good. it says barriers to entry are low. Okay. Increasing. So, I mean, at, at what point do I look at the report and say, well, the report tells me something completely different to the way that I could fit this to the overall score. So do you start adjusting everything else to fit to the well, overall score? Well, <clears throat> what you have to do is you have to establish a point of view. And if the IBIS mm -hmm. report, if you go with the IBIS report, says mm -hmm. low, then something else is going to have to be a higher score. So that's what I'm saying. We, we have to come up with a point of view about why this industry is making money. So let's assume the barriers are not it. What is it? What's causing these, these generally faster food takeout services to make so much money in the context of the five forces? That's exactly what my problem is. Because when I think of substitutes, I think if I had you know $7 in my pocket and I'm standing in Chinatown, mm -hmm. I have a bunch of options. Chipotle is not my only option. Okay. So to me, there are a lot of substitutes. So the power of the substitute effect is also low. So then you start going to the other ones, the buyer, the supplier, and the rivalry. Um, I mean, the overall score is high, so one of those three has to be toggled high. So you, to me, I would start thinking about, well, what's the one that I have the least amount of hard information on? Which to me is either rivalry or to a certain extent, buyer and supplier power. Okay. I would toggle one of those two high just because I have no real hard information to say rivalry is either low or high. Okay, so let's let's ramp down the uh, uh, entry and exit. We'll call that a three. Make that a four. But even if we do that, something's got to be a five if we call this industry a five. Or we have to change our definition of an overall if we have trouble defining the, the others to be a slightly lower score. But as I said, this industry is making 22%. Yes? Um, the reason why the industry is making so much money is because it's uh, general trend population. There's you know fewer uh, whole families, 
and even still, and there's more than one person who's working, like so people are getting paid out more and more often. So uh, their customer base is increasing, the market is actually growing, and that's why. So what that suggests is that means rivalry is not really hurting them because there's so much demand relative to the supply that pretty much any of these players is going to do well just because the demographic trends are so good for them right now. I mean, if there were 30 big firms rather than 15, maybe then there would be much more supply to compete. But right now, it's just they're just benefiting from this good, you know, generally long-term trend that you're actually pointing out. So that's the point, that the rivalry is, is not that tough amongst the firms. It may appear to be tough, but what I'm telling you is it's not like they're offering... You know, even the 99 cent dollar meal at McDonald's is a dollar 29. I mean, that they've raised the dollar meal price by 30 percent over the last two years. So again, we think about rivalry. If they're really that much cut their rivalry, they should be cutting their prices. Should be raising their prices. Now again, part of it could be commodity costs are going up, but that's the point. They're passing it all along without really worrying about the impacts of what's happening to customers because more people are going to these these companies. Right? Yes. So in line with that, um, which one of these forces would you say is more susceptible to an overall economic performance? The so biggest like short-term impact, if you go back to Porter theory, is rivalry. Because rivalry is based on supply and demand. And so therefore, in, if you think about poor economic times, generally in poor economic times, when you get that more supply-demand imbalance because people have less demand, then you don't change the supply as fast then rivalry is typically the one that's going to be the most sensitive to economic power. And then tied to that would be buyers. Right? And then loosely tied to that would be substitutes. Those are probably the, but rivalry definitely trumps all in the short run. Right? But, but here's the point. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but what I really want to spend time on is the next piece, which is let's just say this is our final one. And we basically say that, you know what, it is, if we'll go with the IBIS report, it's not the rivalry, or sorry, it is the rivalry that's making the differentiator. It's not the barriers to entry. So let's go with this. How is this going to change in five years? Because that's the most important part of this analysis, which is what's the ROIC for this industry going to look like in five years? Right. And, and I say this because did I tell my Dow Chemical story to you guys? All right. So, yes, I did. Clarksley. I'm sorry? Clarksley. No. So, um, basically, uh, in the 90s, I was working for uh, Dow Chemical, and they had a new head of strategic planning that came in. And <clears throat> they were pretty lousy at their capital budgeting process. So, basically, what he did was they looked at, for capital budgets that were approved, he asked for all the ones that were approved over a five-year period of time. And he wanted to see how well they actually performed versus what was promised. Okay, Because when people submitted their internal requests, they put in a commitment. These were the ones that were approved. They got the funding. And then they just said, let's go back and do an after-action review and see what actually happened versus what was promised. The average plan missed its target by 50%. By the way, under. Okay, They underperformed their promise by 50%. And these were the ones that were approved. These were just the random ones that were submitted. And they said, you know what, we're, we're really not that good at planning if we're missing by 50% of the ones that were approved. So then they said, well, why? Like, what's the main reason we seem to be moving, missing that much? And the number one reason was relative to the price and the sales, that they were overestimating the benefit, particularly the sales, and they were, they were kind of closer to what their costs were going to be. And to be honest with you, what they said was that they had about 20% of the global chemical industry at the time. If their capital budgets had come true, they would have gotten 40% of the chemical industry market share. And what they ignored were things like competitive response. That just because you cut the price doesn't mean your competitors are going to sit there and cede all the market share to you. They're going to do something about that. So long story short, they brought in a company called Maricon to do these what are called deep drills. And as part of the deep drill process, Maricon advocated they change their forecasting process to do ROIC-based forecasting. And with the ROIC-based forecasting, what they did was they said, don't forecast your price, forecast your ROIC. 
And then based on the ROIC, figure out what that price would be based on that ROIC. So for example, <clears throat> let's say your costs go down, but your ROIC doesn't change. Then what's going to most likely happen is your price is going to go down. But typically when we do pricing, what most people do is they do price plus inflation. Right? They just assume prices go up and costs go down, the margins increase. But that never actually really happens in competitive markets. So they went back to the plans that they were analyzing and they reforecasted them, assuming they were doing ROIC based pricing, and they came almost dead on to what actually happened. And to me, just observing the process, it was almost like a light bulb went on and said, that's a much better way to do forecasting. And that's really what we're doing here, is that <clears throat> what we're really trying to understand is how well are these companies that we're analyzing going to do in the future. And ultimately, what we're doing is we're forecasting the ROIC, and we're using the five forces as a way for us to forecast the ROIC. So rather than doing it directly, we're saying, look, if the industry structure is not going to change, then the return should be the same in five years that they are today. If the industry structure is getting better, then the return should be improving. If the industry structure is getting worse, the return should be going down. So this is actually the more important part of the conversation is whatever numbers you come up with the forces, the real important part is how are those forces are going to change in five years? So let's think about that one. So given those numbers, let's just assume we're okay with the numbers that are on this sheet. Are these numbers going to change in five years? So buyer power. Is buyer power going to get worse for us, meaning the buyers have more power? Is the buyer power going to get better, meaning that this growth is just going to continue so much, the demand is just going to overwhelm these firms? Or is it going to be about the same in five years? All right, so I heard an about the same and a worse. Who says, uh, you said about the same? What's the argument for about the same? Um, um, I, don't, I, I don't see any, any changes in the dynamics. I mean, I really don't see any changes in the dynamics. I think the more people working, like you mentioned, and so you have more demand continuing, um, uh, you need short order things. And so I, I don't really see the dynamics really splitting, splintering off from where they are. From where they are right now. I don't think I could be totally split. Yeah. Uh, I would say that it's, it's going to get worse because, in, like you said, McDonald's and these other larger firms with more cash are fully up market and taking their Chipotle segment. So the rivalry is going to increase and their power is going to get worse. Okay. So you think there's going to be just more supply, more choice, and more aggression to get these customers? Okay. Yes. Also, pe people are fickle. They may get tired of Chipotle. Remember, when we say Chipotle, be careful with this part of the analysis because we're not just talking about Chipotle. We're talking about the Chipotle and its peers. That's the next part. The next part is talking about Chipotle. Right now, we're just trying to look at an industry level that Chipotle's in as opposed to Chipotle itself. But, but again, expand on your comment. The same argument applies because as people are likely to get richer, you know, if you're optimistic about the economy, then they're probably going to move to a different uh, industry. Okay. More sit down restaurants. All right. Yes. Um, my thought is that if we have an industry that has a 15% like spread on the ROIC, you're just going to have people that see that, and not many industries can match that. So you can have more capital going into that industry. No, there's definitely a you know other people are going to notice this, and they're going to start aggressively going after these this level of return. I mean that that generally is what happens, which is one of the reasons why, and that's why I showed you that chart in Monday's class from the book which talks about industry spreads tend to compress over time. And part of it is industries mature, but part of it is because the attractive industries tend to get a competitive attention by other people that, yes, there's barriers to entry, but at the same time, if you have an industry making 23%, then people are going to be going after that industry segment. So that could cause more rivalry. That could lower some barriers to entry as bigger players look at that industry. That could cause more attention and more substitutes to become much more viable to this industry because then the substitutes become more aggressive relative to the peers. Exactly. Not saying it's going to happen, but that's the point of view. And by the way, even today, when you're doing this industry, there's difference of opinion on the way five years from now this industry is going to play out. So again, what this class is more about is it's a little bit more process. So again, there's not necessarily a right answer to some of these. And, and really, as I grade you, by the way, because ultimately you have to be graded in a degree-based class, what I'm going to be looking for is did you follow a process and can you support it with sort of some facts and or some logic? 
as opposed to just randomly plugging in some numbers. So, so that's really the point. I mean, we can have some disagreement on what the facts turn out to be, but as long as you're kind of giving a point of view that's supported, then that's really what we're really trying to do here. Because that's what the analysts are doing in the real world, by the way. Right. So, so back to this. Um, make your point. I, I, just have, I have a question. Yes. Um, in Bloomberg, is there a way to get a up-to-date um, cross-industry ROIC average? So that we can say that an ROIC in a particular industry is likely to converge to that ROIC? Um, probably. I don't know how to do it directly. But let me tell you one other great feature of Bloomberg. <clears throat> if you're in Bloomberg, and this is the advantage of, of using a $15,000 piece of software, uh, they have great help. So if you click on the help button, which is the little question mark, then it'll give you help to the screen that you're in, but they have this chat help for live help. And unlike most chat helps, um, this chat help actually is staffed by people that know what they're doing. All right, so it's not call center people just responding to scripts. Um, as a matter of fact, that's one of the things Bloomberg does is they hire every new undergrad or MBA they hire has to work the help desk for the first year just to learn the software and they actually make it a point to try and help you do what you do in responding to the questions. So what I would say is if you ever want to do something like that and you're uncertain, just ask them. So um, we'll just say uh, using the RV screen, is, it, is there an easy way to uh, compare ROICs across multiple industries. So we'll ask our question, and then, again, I'm, I'm assuming that we're going to actually get a reasonable answer, but I don't know. But we'll see. I'll leave this open for a second while we finish this exercise off. All right, so just because I want to close this out, and I don't want to drag this on for too much longer, uh, I want one person to give me your point of view. So one brave soul in this room, give me five numbers for each one of these forces. Your five-year forecast, your prognostication. All right. Uh, three, four, 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 and four. All right. And <laughs> okay. All right. So some rationale for that, because obviously that was pretty rat-a-tat-tat. Well. <laughs> I've been thinking, lawyers, for the reason I mentioned, um, suppliers, I think they're going to stay about the same. I don't think they're going to get more power. Uh, substitutes are going to be a few more, but not many more. Okay. Uh, barriers to entry are going to be quite high. And rivalry, uh, I think it's going to make more of an impact. Okay. And that's why I chose for the suppliers. So, so your overall feeling is that this is going to be a tougher industry in five years. Yes. So what you're really saying is, and you didn't use half, half points. You could. By the way, if you want to get more granular in your scores, like you want to say 3.75 or you know, 3.82, feel free. <clears throat> but what you're really saying is if right now the industry ROIC is, what was it, 22, 23? Then what you're really saying is in five years it might be, what, 15? So it's going to be lower. And that's really the point of what we're trying to do here is think about this. If we're trying to project Chipotle, we're trying to figure out Chipotle's ROIC in five years, what we're going to do is we're breaking it into two pieces. The first piece is, is Chipotle going to get better, or worse, or the same because the industry is getting better or worse or the same? And then we get to competitive advantage. Is Chipotle getting better or worse because it's doing better or worse against its peers? So maybe the reason Chipotle is getting worse is not because it's doing anything worse, it's just in a more difficult industry, right? Or maybe the reason Chipotle is getting worse is the industry is doing okay, they're just not doing so well. And, and we want to be able to differentiate between those two, and that's part of what this analysis is about. So a rising tide should rise all the boats, right? So you're doing better because you're in a great industry is different than you're doing better because you're actually exhibiting competitive advantage. And it could be a combination of both, but right now, we're just trying to look at what's happening in the industry. So all I know is if I'm thinking about Chipotle in five years, their return on investment should be under pressure 
because they're getting into a more difficult environment. A slower growth, more competitive, I'm just using what you're giving me with these scores. Slower growth, more competitive, more rivalry-based environment. That's your point of view. Yes? Yes. You um, sh shouldn't we also look at the other side of this and that if everything's getting worse in this industry, isn't the risk quotient for the industry also increasing so the whack will change? So therefore, what you really should be doing here is the spread. So right now, the spread is about 15. So what you're really saying is the spread's probably going to be closer to, I don't know, 10? Yeah. So, and again, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to keep it simple to focus on the ROIC. But in an ideal world, you're right. You're talking about the spreads. So really, it's the spread of the industry that is decreasing. Because if you think the risk is also going up, that the asset betas are going to be higher in this industry, then you're talking about a lowering spread in this industry. Right. But generally, when you talk about companies, the risk of the companies, if they're truly pure, shouldn't be all that different. So the biggest differentiator should probably be the ROIC. Right. So that's why I focus on the ROIC. Right. But that's a good point. Right. By the way, let me just double check Bloomberg real quick. <laughs> Hello. All right. Hello. Okay. It's actually checking into this. It's like, it's Saturday. This is the weekend help desk. <laughs> Nobody's going to believe me that the help desk is actually very efficient. It just answers, hello. <laughs> Could you repeat your question? All right. <clears throat> so the third part of the homework assignment and your analysis is going to be competitive advantage, or what we'll call the C part of the EIC. All right. And again, <clears throat> in 20 years of consulting and working with companies, no matter how poorly run the company, I have never been to a company that doesn't believe they have competitive advantage. They could just be losing millions of dollars and have no market share and laying off people, and they think they're good at something. Right? Maybe it's just laying off people. That's what they're good at. But everyone thinks they have competitive advantage. So in this class, we are going to define competitive advantage financially. So the idea is if you truly have competitive advantage, you consistently have a better return than your peers. So you should have better spreads than your peers to demonstrate real competitive advantage. That's going to be our definition we're going to apply to competitive advantage. So therefore, <clears throat> it's going to be the return on invested capital of your company against the return on invested capital of the industry. Now, like I said, if you want to be more sophisticated, it's the spread of your company against the spread of the industry. But by proxy, to keep it simple, ROIC of your company against the ROIC of the industry. Right? By the way, those, that's Bloomberg typing back at me. So we'll see if he actually says an answer. All right. Yellow box marked add column halfway down. Enter ROIC. Select field. Um, yeah. <laughs> You want to add another industry as a peer group. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so let's go back to the data in Bloomberg for Chipotle. So given this data, Chipotle is right here at the top, does Chipotle have competitive advantage? No. Given the definition we just gave. No. 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 So, so here's the thing. Chipotle is doing really well. They got a 22% ROIC against an under 10% cost of capital. So Chipotle is creating value on the capital that it's been deployed. Right? But... They're not doing better than the average of their peers. Right? So translation. Chipotle is doing well because they're in a good industry. Right? So not saying that Chipotle is not a well-run firm, but you know what? There's some other well-run firms that they're competing with. So that's the point. They're doing well in an in EQS screen. Um, no. What does it do? Do.
you laugh, but that's what I'm saying. At least they try and help you. Like they're actually trying to answer your question. Ah, that is what I want. All right, we'll check. Out. <laughs> Heck it out. Okay. So. Okay. So you can have multiple industries on that screen. EQS. Thank you. Sorry, I don't mean to cut him off. But we're in a class. Because that's that's they actually will stealth with help you with you. By the way, I'll just just to see what he's talking about uh, for Chipotle. Actually, I just wonder if I can go to EQS directly. EQS, equity screening. Identify companies. Oh, I'll have to play with it later. Yes. When we did the, so yeah, so we did the, um, the industry average. Yep. Uh, is that, was that industry average based on market cap? So yes, this is market cap weighted average. Okay. So it is a weighted average. Dominoes can skew yeah. the heck out of it. But again, because Domino's is only two billion, that's why it's not a straight average. Would actually make it much more important than the weighted average. We got the same question. All right. So, but back to this. So here's the final part of your C. So the first part is: Does Chipotle have competitive advantage? No. All right. Will that change in five years? So if we're predicting, back to the industry analysis that this industry is going to fall to, let's just use 18%, is so that the number you kind of came up with, the four? Then the question is, does that mean Chipotle is going to earn 18% in five years as well because they're just going to go down with the rest of the industry because their relative performance to their peers isn't going to change? Or does Chipotle have something that allows them to do better than the industry so that as the industry goes to 18, Chipotle stays higher than 18? That would be competitive advantage. Okay. Or does Chipotle get worse than the industry going down to 18, if that's our view? Right? So, again, does somebody have an, a view on Chipotle? Personal or otherwise? Does this also have to do with, like, their costs, you know? Well, again, we're talking about the return on investment, so cost is part of this. Productivity is part of this. This is the overall return and the risk. Right? So let's assume that the so spread's about the same. Right now, like Obviously, expanding, so maybe they're spending a lot of money, but in five years, yeah, they'll have a competitive advantage because they spent the money, and, and now they're just redoing the process. Yeah, and by the way, if anybody saw Chipotle's news, part of the reason I picked Chipotle is they were in the news last week. Why was Chipotle in the news last week? <clears throat> and by the way, when I say news, here's what happened to their stock price when they released their news. Let me go to... Google Finance, or not, I thought I was connected to the internet, there I am, and let's look up Chipotle, and here is their stock price, there's one month, but you can see that their stock price was at 290, and then in one day, it dropped to 250, so they lost $40 a share price. Anybody know why? It had to do with their earnings release. Yeah. The, the real problem with their earnings release was they missed their sales expectations, but particularly what they missed was same-store sales. Same-store sales didn't grow. So Chipotle has been growing because they've been opening new stores, but also more people have been going to their existing stores. And this quarter, Chipotle didn't see any same-store sales growth, and that shocked the market. Because the, given this, the trend that everybody was talking about, and McDonald's, by the way, reported the same thing. And so McDonald's also had an adjustment down with their share price. But <clears throat> that's what you're seeing, is that we've assumed the trend that was mentioned earlier is that, hey, people are just keep going to these stores, and they're going to these stores more often, and they're not doing it anymore. So therefore, if people start thinking about their growth, then they're not really getting that growth that they would have expected other same stores. Well, that gets back to the concept of competitive advantage. So if Chipotle is not really seeing that same store growth, and some of their peers are, then they probably don't have as much competitive advantage as we think. Right? And so that's really what the market's questioning with Chipotle right now. 
is what is that level of competitive advantage they really have. Because again, every time I go to the mall, I see 20 people at the line. But the problem is they've had 20 people at that line for Chipotle for three years. So that's the point. They don't have 25 people. They have 20 people. It still uses 20 people. And so they're not getting more sales per store. They're just getting the same amount of sales that they're getting out of stores. But then that's the next question. At some point, will that same store sales start to drop? And if it does, will they have to start doing things like discounting? Because Chipotle has generally, for the last few years, been able to raise price. As commodity costs have gone up, they've raised the price, and their sales have not really taken a hit. Well, now they're starting to take a hit. So going back to the supplier power, you know, right now, as they raise the price because they're getting the higher-end commodities, and the higher-end commodity food costs are going up, and they can't keep raising the price, margins are going to start to shrink. And they're not going to be able to pass it along like they used to. That's the fear that the market has. So again, you know, in five years, like I said, is this a trend that's going to start to continue or is this just kind of a one-time blip given the current state of the economy? So that's, that's really a question that we have to start to answer for any of the companies that we're evaluating. Same thing that you're going to be answering for Best Buy. Okay. Questions, comments? So let's just say with Chipotle, I think their competitive advantage, let's just assume, so it stays about the same. Then what I'm really going to say is that overall, if the industry makes around 18, then I'm projecting about 18 for Chipotle. So that later when I do my model and I'm forecasting out income statements and balance sheets, I'm implicitly forecasting an ROIC. There's going to be a graph in our model of ROIC. So I'd want to see that graph generally start to head towards an 18% range. And then I'd like to see what share price that that suggests for the company, given the cash flows that would support that. Right? So that's really the way that we should be thinking about this exercise. Okay. So that's EIC.